to talk to you about the most important distance on planet Earth. Uh, but first, I'm a galaxy person, so I like to throw up pretty pictures of galaxies. I'm sure most of you have seen this picture. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, and the really exciting thing about this is that everything that you find interesting in astronomy is contained in this picture. You've got some stars, you've got galaxies, you've got really distant galaxies, and that's just in this little quadrant over here. And this image, which was taken by putting a telescope on a really tiny patch of sky and just letting it sit there and collect light for a decent amount of time, shows that if you look long enough, you can find the most distant things in the universe. But the problem is, how far are these things? We have a 2D image. And we really want a three-dimensional picture of the universe because the further away things are, the earlier in time that they are existing. So you can't really just stick your favorite space ruler on there and measure that this galaxy is more than 20 centimeters away from us because it's a little hard to get there and to actually give a nice measurement. So we need to come up with ways of measuring distances without actually going to a place and figuring out how long it took us to get there or how far away something actually is. We can't just take that ruler. So what we do is we call this the cosmological distance ladder, and it starts at the bottom here with planet Earth. You've got to measure things like Earth before you can jump up to things like the distance to galaxies at the edge of our universe. And the way that we build this up over time is really complicated. Uh, it took a lot of work over thousands and thousands of years. And our story really begins down here with measuring the size of the Earth, which is a lot more challenging than you might imagine. So it really begins with this guy named Eratosthenes. He was a, an ancient Greek. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, a poet. He pretty much did every single thing that you can think of. Um, and eventually he became the head librarian at the Library of Alexandria, which is a pretty sweet gig. Um, and as the librarian in the Library of Alexandria, you get to hear about really cool things that happen all over the world. Um, and he heard a story about something kind of interesting that happened on a very special day at a special time in the city of Syene, which is just south of Alexandria, about 800 kilometers south. So what he heard was that if you look down into a well in Syene at noon on the summer solstice, that the sun didn't touch the edges of the well. It was just in the bottom of the well. It just reflected off the water. It didn't illuminate the edges of the well at all. And from this, he gathered that the sun must be directly overhead. And he thought, well, that's kind of funny, because on that same day and that same time in Alexandria, which is just to the north, a stick cast a shadow. Well, that's kind of strange. So he thought, well, I know that the Earth is round. So sorry to any flat earthers out there, but he knows that the Earth is round. And he said, well, if I assume that it's round, and I assume that the sun is far enough away that all of its rays are parallel when they hit the Earth, then if one ray gets all the way to the bottom of the well in Syene, but makes a shadow in Alexandria, then I should be able to use that shadow to measure the angular separation between Alexandria and Syene. And that's exactly what he did. He waited around until the summer solstice. He went out to his favorite stick that stood upright in the ground. And he measured the length of this shadow. And using that, he was able to figure out that this angle created right here is 7.2 degrees. And he said, wow, that's 1 50th of a circle. Interesting. So since he knows that this distance between these two cities is 800 kilometers, and that makes up 1 50th of this entire circle, then he can say, well, the circumference of the Earth must be 40,000 kilometers. And it turns out that without ever leaving Egypt, he was actually correct. He was off by about 2%, which is pretty incredible for a guy with a stick in the ground. So thanks to our man Eratosthenes, we were able to build up the first step on our ladder to measuring distant galaxies. All right, so you got the distance of the Earth, the size of the Earth. That's all nice. But how do you measure the, si or the distance from the Earth to the sun? Right? If you really needed to, you could have walked around the entire Earth. But you can't really walk to the sun. That would be kind of difficult. So for a very long time, people said, well, I don't know how far that is in kilometers, but we're just going to say it's one astronomical unit. We're just going to call it that. Everything can be measured in relation to this. Who cares what the actual distance is? We're just going to call it 1 AU. We're done. But then this guy... Despite having uh, this really awesome hair, he was also pretty good at math. So Christian Huygens said, hey, I can actually measure that in kilometers. Which was really exciting because kilometers are a unit that we actually can measure on the Earth. It's not just something that we make up and call one astronomical unit. So in 
what he did was he used some basic trigonometry, which you may recognize from middle or high school, and he said, okay, standing on Earth, I can measure the angle between the Sun and Venus on any given day. So I'm going to wait until Venus, the angle between Venus and the Sun, is a 90 degree angle. And that makes a pretty simple triangle. So you have just a 90 degree angle right here. So you know this angle of the triangle. And then he said, well, I can also just measure this, this angle right here. Easy peasy. All he needs to do now is measure the distance between the Earth and Venus on this given day when you have this 90 degree angle. And then using properties of trigonometry, you can just figure out the, disc or the length of this side of the triangle. So it's just simple trig. So what he did was he said, uh, he made one incredible assumption. He said, you know what, I'm just going to assume that Venus and the Earth are the same size. And this was a pretty bold assumption for someone who really didn't know that that was true. Um, but, <laughs> but it turns out that it's actually not so bad of an assumption. Good for him, uh, which is why he, he gets the credit. His assumption was correct. And in doing that, he was able to use the angular size of Venus and he was able to compute how far away it was knowing the actual size of Venus. And because he assumed the size of Venus was the same size as the Earth, which we have Eratosthenes to thank for that, he was able to determine that one AU is 160 million kilometers. And he was only wrong by 7%, which is pretty good, because all the people who tried to measure this before him were off by like 60%. And even people who tried to measure it after him were off by like 60%. So he did a pretty good job. So thanks to Christian Huygens, we now have two rungs on our ladder. But I know that you don't just care about stuff between the Earth and the Sun. So what about nearby stars? So to get the distances to nearby stars, we said, okay, well, we don't really know how far away these stars are, and we don't really know how far away these background stars are, but we know how far we move every year. So if we can take a picture in January of this star over here and compare it to the background stars, and then we just wait six months, and we take another picture, and we can see that that foreground star appeared to move. And we can measure the angular movement, apparent movement, of that star, and we can figure out the distance to that star based on this angle right here. Unfortunately, this method is not so useful in practice. Uh, the first parallax measurement wasn't until 1838, and it was to one of the nearest stars to the Earth, 61 Cygni. And the reason why it was to one of the nearest stars is because this angle is ginormous for one of the near stars. But as your star gets farther and farther away, this angle over here gets smaller and smaller. And it gets so small, in fact, that you can't tell if the angular mo the movement, the apparent movement, was actually because something appeared to move, or if it's because the telescope is just not good enough. So that seems like a problem, so we can only do this really in our solar neighborhood. So there's a spacecraft called Gaia. Uh, which is currently operating, and this is what Gaia does. So it measures uh, the apparent motion of a star uh, in the Milky Way. So it's mapping the nearest stars in our galaxy, and will make one of the most accurate maps using this method. So okay, we've gotten nearby stars, we're getting close to the edge of our galaxy, but what if we want distant stars, right? So one thing to remember is that uh, just because it looks really bright doesn't mean that it's close, and just because it looks really dim doesn't mean that it's far away. We need to know something about the intrinsic brightness of that object. So just to remind you, uh, if we have Edison holding a light bulb really close to his face, if it's a 100-watt light bulb, it looks crazy bright when it's close to his face. I mean, imagine holding a light bulb at arm's length. But if we move this light bulb really far away, it still emits 100 watts. It's just really far away, so it looks kind of dim. So in order to observe from Edison's perspective, and say, oh, that's a 100-watt light bulb, you need to know something about either how far away it is or how much light it's actually emitting at any given time. So you need to know something about the source. So Henrietta Swan Leavitt was a woman who worked at Harvard. Uh, she was one of the Harvard computers. Uh, they were women who worked on everything. Um, so <laughs> what she did was she looked at stars that vary in their brightness. So here's an example of just a little movie of a star varying in brightness. They're called Cepheid variables, and they vary really predictably. So you can tell, uh, they have a really predictable period. Um, you can tell when they're going to get brighter, when they're going to get dimmer. And Henrietta Swan-Levitt was using a sample of stars that she knew the distance to. 
So she knew intrinsically how much light they were giving off. She knew their intrinsic brightness. And by knowing that, she was able to, to match their period to their brightness. So she found that things that had a really low intrinsic brightness, so they were intrinsically dim sources, had a very short period of variation. And things that had a really long or a really large intrinsic brightness, they were really bright intrinsically, had a really long period of variation. So she was able to use this to determine how far away things were because she knew how intrinsically bright they were. And just like with our 100 watt light bulb, if we know that it's 100 watts, even if it's far away, we can figure out that distance because we know that it's giving off 100 watts. So Henrietta Swan-Levitt was one of the, the first to find Cepheid variables and figure out a way to measure the distance to a star that you could not get a parallax for. The other way to do this with distant stars is with type 1a supernova, and these are sort of the ultimate standard candle. So supernova, type 1a supernova, are thought to be uh, stars that explode when they reach a particular mass. And since they all explode at the same mass, we assume that they explode with the same energy. So if you know, theoretically, how much energy they're giving off, you can compare how much you observe to how much you know that they're giving off, and you can scale their distance based on that. So here's just a cool movie of a supernova going off in 2015 in the galaxy. There's a little red circle there. You'll see the supernova explode. It gets really bright, and then it starts to dim over time. And these light curves, or what they call them, are really predictable. Uh, they fall off at a certain rate. So if you know how long it's been since your supernova went off, you can match that to a, an intrinsic brightness, uh, and then you know how far away your star is. The huge downside with all of this is that they really can't be predicted. You can't pick your favorite galaxy and wait around for a supernova to go off just to find out how far away it is. So we need to figure out some kind of other method. But officially, the Cepheid variables and the type 1a supernova uh, get us all the way up here close to the top of our distance ladder. So for the final rung of our distance ladder, we have Edwin Hubble to thank. He was looking at galaxies that had known distances from variable stars or type 1a supernova, and he was looking at their spectral lines. So we heard about spectral lines from uh, Dr. Sokol and from Sinclair earlier. So you see there's some spectral lines right here, and they move to the right. Well, if he knew the distance, and he could calculate how far away, or how fast they were moving away from us using where these spectral lines fell, then he figured out that there is a clear relationship between how fast something's moving away from us and how far away it actually is from us. So what we do is we call this redshift. So uh, as we learned earlier, each chemical element gives off light at a specific wavelength, and we know this from laboratory experiments, and we call it the rest frame wavelength. And so that's sort of this unshifted spectrum here. So each of these lines is absorbed at their rest frame wavelength. But when something's moving away from you, those, uh, each of these elements emits at a slightly longer wavelength. So you can see that every one of these lines is proportionally shifted to the red region of the spectrum, so red shifted. And if you have a rare object that's close by the, to the Milky Way, then it's blue shifted, and everything gets shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. This is how we find out how far away a distant galaxy is. We take a spectrum of it, and we look for lines that we recognize, and we say, okay, that line has been shifted to this other wavelength. And with that, we can figure out how far away it is thanks to Hubble and Dr. Sheldon Cooper. So finally, with that, we're able to build up our entire distance ladder. Um, every single thing in this ladder builds off of something else. And of course, it all started with a guy with a stick in Alexandria, who was able to measure the size of the Earth without ever leaving Egypt. And uh, thanks to his uh, innovative technology, we are now able to measure uh, the distances to the farthest galaxies in the universe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Agent Sheila, thank you. All right, questions? The eager first hand, we'll go there. Ah, wonderful question. So the question was, how did uh, how did Huygens know that Venus was at a right angle with the Earth? And what he did was he actually used the shadow. So when Venus is illuminated by the sun, the back half of it is in shadow. Um, so he just waited until he saw half the planet uh, covered and half the planet exposed, and he knew that he was at maximum elongation. Great question. Back.
So he was waiting until it, well, oh, the question was, uh, how did Eratosthenes know that the sun was directly overhead at noon in Alexandria? How did he know that it was noon? Um, they had, they had clocks. He used clocks, the sundial, mostly. Yeah. yeah, it was based on the sundial, which would have been adjusted based on his location. It's, it's not perfectly scientific. It was a stick in the ground. Okay, more questions. All right, we'll go front row. So the question is, is tabby star a Cepheid variable? And my answer is, I don't know, but I think so. No, definitely not, according to the peanut gallery. <laughs> Yeah, we, we there's no explanation for tabby stars yeah, dimming at this star. point, right? I mean, swarm of comets was the swarm of comets is the best one so far. But yeah, right, 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 or aliens, right, aliens. Always aliens. <laughs> aliens. Oh, aliens. All right, gentleman in the beard is next. So the angular size of Venus. Uh, how did Huygens know that? Um, what he did was he just measured it. It's just uh, an angular measurement. So it's based off of, uh, it's relative to where the observer is. Pretty much. Yeah. All right, one more. The question is, uh, instead of using a triangle, have they tried this with anything else? Um, my guess is no. Mostly because uh, just our motion around the sun creates this triangle naturally. Um, and these stars don't really move. They're far enough away that they don't really move with respect to us. Is that it? All right. Let's thank Agent Ashima one more time.